Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to our service here um, in our sanctuary and also uh, on Facebook Live as we gather for worship on this Transfiguration Sunday here at St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Fleetwood. This morning, we witness Jesus' transfiguration on the mountain with his top three disciples. This is traditionally the Sunday that precedes the beginning of the Lenten season. And so as Jesus leads us and the disciples up to the mountain to witness his glory, we're instructed by God to listen to him. And unable to stay transfixed on the mountain, we follow Jesus down and forward so that we may share his glory with the world. In the order of announcements today, first of all, as this is the last Sunday of Epiphany, Lent begins on Wednesday. Our Ash Wednesday services will be on YouTube. There will be a service at noon in our parking lot and also a service at 7 p.m. here in the sanctuary um, and also on Facebook Live. If you're planning to worship at home on Ash Wednesday, as you leave um, the fellowship area, you can pick up a individual bags of ashes that um, you'll receive instructions on the, during the service as to when to apply them. The Fleetwood Community Bus is looking for volunteer CDL drivers as well as helpers. The purpose of the bus is to help our senior citizens, uh, especially those who are confined to nursing homes and other facilities, to be able to get out and go to the local stores. Um, so if you're qualified and are interested, please let me know and I will pass your name on. Also, on Sunday, February 28th at 1030, we will have our congregational meeting for the purpose of receiving the annual report of the year 2020. Let us begin with the confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose voice is upon the waters, whose mercy is poured out upon all people, whose goodness cascades over all creation. Amen. Let us confess our sin, trusting in the abundant grace of God. Holy God, you search us and know us. You are acquainted with all our ways. We confess that our hearts are burdened by sin, our own sins and the broken systems that bind us. We turn inward failing to follow your outward way of love. We distrust those who are not like us. We exploit the earth and its resources and fail to consider generations to come. Forgive us, gracious God, for all we have done and left undone. Even before the words are on our tongues, you know them. Receive them in your divine mercy. Amen. How vast is God's grace through the power and promise of Christ Jesus, our sins are washed away and we are claimed as God's own beloved. Indeed, we are forgiven. In the wake of God's forgiveness, we are called to be the beloved community, living out Christ's justice and the Spirit's reconciling peace. Amen. The grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And let us share a sign of God's peace. Be with you. And also with you. 
Let us pray. Almighty God, the resplendent light of your truth shines from the mountaintop into our hearts. Transfigure us by your beloved Son and illumine the world with your image. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The first lesson is from the second chapter of 2 Kings. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them, and as they both were standing by the Jordan, then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water. The water was parted to the one side and to the other until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwood into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. Word of God, word of life. The second lesson is from the fourth chapter of 2 Corinthians. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Word of God, word of life. The Holy Gospel for today is told as recorded in the ninth chapter of Mark. Glory to you, Lord. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared Elijah with Moses, talking to Jesus. 
Peter said to him, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for the disciples were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud came a voice saying, This is my Son, the Beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw nobody with them anymore, only Jesus. As they came down the mountain, Jesus ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. So kids, this story oddly got me thinking about picture books, photograph albums. In fact, I pulled out this very recent album that was given to me by St. Paul's for the 40th anniversary of my ordination. And I was looking through here and looking at some of the pictures from my early days in ministry and kind of comparing them to pictures of my current days in ministry. I know that much time has passed. I can simply tell just by the change in my appearance and the amount of hair I have on my head. But you know, it takes albums and albums of pictures to tell our life story. One picture wouldn't be able to do it. For one picture of me in here is just a particular moment, a very specific moment, at a very specific time, in a very particular place. It'd be like someone taking pictures of you at your fifth birthday party. It would be a picture on that day, in your house, around your table, with those friends you had at that time, with a cake with five candles. But one picture cannot capture our whole life. For just as I look through this picture album and you look through yours, you'll see that many, many, many different pictures keep track of your life as you go from one age to another. Maybe you move from one house to another. As you go from one school to the next. Well, something like this is occurring today in the Gospel. For Jesus is glorified on the mountain. The disciples are like blown over by it because they don't know what's going on. And Peter wants to capture it. If he had a camera, he'd want to take a picture of it. Just so he could hold that moment forever. He wants to build some museums. He wants to build a museum for Jesus and one for Peter or, and, or one for Moses and one for Elijah because that's the only way he can understand what's going on. But just like a photo album, what's going on with the disciples when Jesus is glorified before them cannot be captured in one moment or one photograph. For Jesus, just like he goes with us in our life from when we are young to when we are old, so he leads us as disciples from places where he overwhelms us with his glory. But he needs us to keep going to follow him to the next place. And so, the word that I came up with this morning to try in some way describe this experience on the mountain is the word bedazzled. I don't know why this word came to mind, but I couldn't find any other word to express what the disciples may have experienced on the Mount of Transfiguration. Unsuspecting, they are led up to the mountain where immediately Jesus is glorified in their presence. 
And God identifies to them that this, this Jesus, this rabbi and teacher and healer and exerciser of demons whom you've been following is indeed the Son of God. And you need to listen to him. Of course, this would bewilder any human being. And these disciples were no more prepared for what they experienced than would we have been. And so Peter does what comes naturally. He wants to build three shrines so that he and the other disciples can come back up to that mountain and continue to try to figure out what went on. They have a statue of Jesus and one of Moses and one of Elijah. But really, that wasn't the point of what was going on. Just like a photo album, it would take many pictures. On top of the mountain and down in the valley and further on along the sea to capture the full nature of what Jesus was calling them to do. They had to go down the mountain with him. The reason this scripture occurs on this Sunday, as we turn from Epiphany to Lent, is because it helps us remember once again that in Jesus there was a pivotal turning point in the relationship between God and his people. In Jesus, there was not just the teacher. There was not just the one who healed many. Not just the one who cast out many demons. But this indeed was God's Son, the Savior, the Messiah. And from now on, his ministry would take on a more intense nature. And the disciples would learn that what he did and said was not just about helping people. It was about saving people from the likes of sin and death. The rabbi is now the Messiah and Savior. The one who appeared talking with Moses and Elijah is revealed as one greater than Moses, the lawgiver, and one greater then Elijah, the great prophet, who was swept up into heaven by chariots of fire. It is through Jesus that the entire focus of our understanding of God's nature and his relationship with us is revealed. Revealed through the Gospels and the letters of the New Testament. And only through these things, only through understanding that Jesus is the one who taught, who suffered, who died and rose for us, that we can understand the words of the Old Testament. The prophets who were prophesying about the great future to come, the future fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Now it may seem odd to you that Jesus instructed the disciples to be silent as they came down the mountain. But yet, if you put yourself in the feet of the disciples, you too would be silent. You'd want to be silent because being so overwhelmed by a, an experience you can't explain, it is too soon for words. The words would come in time. Jesus would be sure to demonstrate by what he did and said, so that the disciples would more fully understand what they were doing. In short, we know the end of the story. As Jesus rises from the dead, and the disciples would soon discover that at the cross of Jesus. But for the meantime, they needed to understand, they needed to experience they needed to appreciate that what had been given to them on the mountain was simply an experience of the glory of Christ, which they were now invited 
to take down into the valleys, into the world, to share. So what do we do? Having heard this story, having been given a glimpse of that mountaintop experience, a place where God lifted the veil just a little bit between heaven and earth so we could see something of the magnificence of God. What do we do? When do we speak? How do we show this glory to the world? Well, there are three suggestions I have. First of all, in time, as you understand it, speak to others what you hear Jesus speaking to you. The Word of God comes to us and is revealed to us in specific moments in time. When we're going through specific experiences, and they help us to see the world differently, to see possibilities where before we saw none. Share that experience with someone else, because it is in these relational methods of proclaiming the gospel that the Word of God grabs other people because they can hear and see it working in you. Secondly, go wherever Christ shows you to go. I know, like me, you have found yourself in places and in experiences where you didn't expect to be. Sitting across the table from people you didn't expect to be talking to. And finding yourself in a place and with a word to share. Thirdly, be confident. Wherever you go and whatever you say. For Jesus has demonstrated throughout the Gospels and throughout our, our own lives his ability to confidently equip us with what we need. Words come when we feared they would Actions are done when we didn't think we knew what to do. People respond to us who we thought would be deaf to a word about Christ. This is because the glory of Christ has been shown to us and once we see it and experience it, it is in us. And it shines from us. That's what we carry down from the Mount of Transfiguration. This is what we go into Lent with. The glory of God in our hearts. The glory of God that comes to us. Because we live in a world that is so broken. Because we stumble in our faith and in our life. Because it's through those very things that God has chosen to heal and to teach and to cast out the demons of the world. This is the glory that God shines through us so that the light of Epiphany can shine our way through the journey of Lent. Amen.
Let us pray together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for peace between nations and peace between peoples. We give our prayer to you, good and gracious God, hear our prayer. Let us pray for peace in our homes and peace in our communities. We bring our prayer to you. We have been so blessed by the gifts and the presence of God. Let us give thanks for the ways he has shared abundantly with us so that we can in turn share abundantly with others. O oh God, receive our offerings as you receive us. Like a mother receives her child with arms wide open. Nourish us anew in your tender care and empower us in faithful service to tend others with this same love through Jesus Christ, our saving grace. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God our thanks and praise. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people 
for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And please join me as we pray the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May our children be blessed in, in knowing that Jesus shines his glory also through you, shines the glory of his gentleness, his peace, and his love. Amen. Beloved, here is bread, here is wine, here is Jesus. Come and be fed. I invite you to take your wafer and receive it as the body of Christ which is given for you. And likewise, the cup is the blood of Christ, which is shed for you. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the gifts of his body and blood strengthen, keep, and unite us now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> Let us pray. Christ Jesus, at this table we have feasted on your very life and are strengthened for our journey. Send us forth from this banquet nourished in body and in spirit to proclaim your good news and serve others in your name. Amen. <clears throat> Let us bless the Lord. of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and evermore. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Be the light of Christ. Thanks be to God.